Hey everyone, my name is Sam. Thanks for checking out this video. If you get to the end like if you get to the end and liked it, then give it a thumbs up, hit the subscribe, and the bell notification button. As always, for like the hundred of you that watch this, this is my weekly wrap up where I tell you my thoughts on the books that I read this week. I didn't read as many books as I normally do this week just because I read one of my quite chunkier ones and I just had doctor's appointments and running around more today this week, so I didn't have as much just chill at home time. Um, but the books I read this week were actually really, really good, and I wanted to tell you about them. So literally what I just exact opposite said. The Bookish Life of Nina Hill is the first book I picked up this week, and it was actually my least favorite of the week. But that being said, all the books this week were just good in general. Um, this is a book lover's rom-com, okay? That's like your target audience. This is for like the booktuber watching community. This is for people who are in like the Owl Crate Society or TBR and Beyond and just read. knocked over. Oh, it's cool. It was just guest all. Also, excuse the fact that I'm wearing like a beanie toque. I'm 27 and trying to pretend I'm beginning to be 20 years old. Um, anyways, um, The Bookish Life of Nina Hill. It is a contemporary romance. Um, there is absolutely no smut or anything like that to this, but we have our main character who works for a local indie bookshop in uh, the California area. I don't know if it's like downtown LA. I don't know the geography. I don't know the geography of Los Angeles. I just know that it's overpriced, expensive, and for some reason you guys keep moving there despite the fact that they keep getting earthquakes and droughts. Um, but she has her life set. She's very introvert. She's, even knowing that, she's far more social than I am. Um, but she's a very organized person. She does this on Mondays, this on Tuesdays, this on Wednesdays. And things kind of get, like, warped out of chaos when all of a sudden she gets contacted by someone um, that her father's will had included her in it. Um, she's never met her father. Her mother has never told her anything about him. Um, he's never been a part of her life. So, of course, his, his life comes along with a bunch of kids and grandkids and nieces and nephews, and he had lots of money and all this stuff. So it's her kind of getting to know her family, which is obviously going to disrupt her schedule, cycle, whatever, her habits. And then at the same time, she interacts with a gentleman at her team's trivia, um, like, battle off. I don't know what, what the heck to call it, but, like, you have trivia teams and, like, you, you tournaments and that sort of stuff. Um, he is on one of the other teams, and they start having a fling going on. She doesn't quite know what to do with it. Um, she Something that my friend mentioned that I, I can't really totally relate to. I had anxiety during grad school and undergrad school. I was on uh, medications for anxiety or anti-anxiety and antidepressant medications. Since I've left those situations, like my finances and everything have changed and I don't need to take those medications anymore. Um, I'm not working full time, going to school full time and running on the same sleep deprivation and poor eating and anything like that. And a lot of those changes has resulted in I just don't need those things anymore. But some people are bored, like they just anxiety is a part of their life from start to finish and I, so I, I can't really relate to someone like that. It seems like the character is someone who does have lifelong anxiety of some sort. My friend Melanie has that and she was quite upset with it. At one scene she kind of has a meltdown. She She's she's anxious, she's freaking out. She wants to be left alone um, and she kept, keeps saying like I want to be left alone, I want to be left alone and she finally snaps on the guy when he, he's like I'm just trying to help, I'm just trying to help. She's like no I need you to leave. Um, and I don't know that he totally gets it in the end, but he he, he seems to care. Um, so my friend Melanie was quite, like, frustrated but that he wasn't listening. But I can also see of, like, I don't think people totally understand lifelong anxiety disorders um, until they themselves have them or their, like, best friend or their, their girlfriend or whatever has them and they learn about them. So I, I think that was something that I didn't really see until she had mentioned it afterwards. And I was like, honestly, it just seemed like a guy who didn't know how to handle it when... People cope with freaking out and anxiety in different ways. It was an all right book. It was a quick read. I think I gave it a three and a half or four out of five stars. It was enjoyable, quick, fun. Um, the romance was cute. I don't think it was totally developed, but it's a very short book, so I wasn't expecting it to be. And yeah, I love like the support community around this local indie shop. Oh my God, sorry. The hat's come off. It's so hot in here all of a sudden. Or maybe it's just because the hat is like dollar store. Like it's plastic. It's garbage material. So it's probably just holding all the heat from the top of my head. Anyways, after the, like, the bookish life of Nina Hill, I picked up These Witches Don't Burn by Isabel Sterling, which I have been so curious and anxious to read um, since like, for like a year now. I feel like I've known about it for coming out for a while. 
This is a debut own voices by sexual rep. Um, and then we also have um, a trans character from female to male who has a boyfriend. And then we also have um, people who identify as lesbian. I also freaking love the dedication before we even get into this. Oh my God, turn pages, turn pages. Um, for my wife, Megan, meeting you changed everything, including this story. That is such a sweet dedication. Ah. Um, it's set in a contemporary setting in Salem, and our main character has powers. Um, she's a part of a local coven, and it, people don't openly use magic, though, and it's like our kind of contemporary world. But she, it starts off like kind of awkwardly that her and her girlfriend broke up, and we never quite, we don't know exactly vividly what happens it kind of like bits and pieces are dropped throughout the story of what happened but her girlfriend wants her back and she's not um necessarily down for that after everything that happened with the breakup and then this new girl transfers in who is bisexual and things start between them and at the same time they think there's a witch hunter in town which if you know anything about Salem, <laughs> it's never a good sign. Uh, so it's this whole mystery that things keep happening. There's break-ins uh, amongst the coven. And then when you're underage in these covens, you're not necessarily supposed to use magic. So some of them have magic like bonds put on them. So they can't and puts them in danger. And then of course this relationship drama and this like triangle set up. And it was just honestly really interesting. I enjoyed this. I'm for a debut, I didn't, I don't, again, I don't, I think I've, I've said this a few times this year, which is good. I don't think this book found a lot, into a lot of the pit holes that debut authors tend to with plots or trying to world build or anything like that. Um, it was pretty straightforward, simple that this is modern day Salem. Um, if you, you know, you could kind of just imagine it then and there. And then there's like, oh, well, okay, there's like this witch temple thing. Okay. And then these people live here and these people live here. So you can kind of paint it in your head, but there's no vivid details given, but it's not really necessary. Uh, I think one thing that is really lacking in here is the magic structure. It's never really explained. We know that they have these witches. There's also blood witches, which are coming in and have from the past story, um, past of some of these characters that have, have caused problems. And so we know that is going to come up. And then there's the witch hunter. But none of it really, there's no structure. I don't know what's capable, what's incapable, what what really any of this means. <laughs> but that being said, the main characters are all underage. They're not supposed to be using magic. And so I can understand why we wouldn't get that. Hopefully the structure will come with book two, because I think we're going to have to have some magical battles with how this ends. And I really, really, really hope there's a really clear definition put between the blood witches and the coven that is in Salem, because they have this beef, um, for lack of a better term, um, for some reasons that, it, again, it's not totally explained. So there's a lot left open here for the sequel, um, but I think you're given all the information you need, and I am definitely going to watch for this to pop up on Book Outlet, and I would really actually recommend this. It promised Queer Witches, and it gave me Queer Witches, but then on top of that, I've been struggling a fair amount, I feel like, in the last few years, trying to find a book that's, like, heavy queer rep. Like, not just, like, one person is, is lesbian or anything like that, but heavy queer rep of multiple representations and then it also being a good story. And I feel like I was looking for that, especially in um, the King Arthur sci-fi retelling by um, is it Once, Once in Future. And that one didn't work for me. I found it really lacking in terms of plot and just everything. So this one kind of filled that gap that has just been sitting there empty, which is wonderful. And this is one that I can definitely see myself rereading around Halloween continuously. It was a really enjoyable read. There's not many big twists and turns. The overall mystery was really good, but I feel like um, I didn't know, I was guessing the whole time about who exactly was the witch hunter. Um, and now that I know at the end, I still feel like I want to go back and reread and see if I missed things because all of the characters were so equally developed, even the side characters, that you didn't have this one character that you were like, okay, well, you're obviously gearing us towards this. We know so much more about this person. Or there was someone that like kind of kept popping up, but was never developed. And you're like, that's kind of weird. Why are you here then? All of them, I feel like were lifted up equally with their own background and plot. And I really, really, really enjoyed that, especially. Then I read We Hunt the Flame by Hafsei Haf Faisal. I'm sorry, I'm not saying that right. I'm trying, man. Uh, this is was a, the group voted on TBR and Beyond pick for the month. It was in the Owl Crate box, I think, last month or the month before. Um, everyone was really, really hyped about this. I feel like at the beginning of the year. And then everyone got it and everyone, like, I just don't think anyone's actually read it. So I'm really curious to see how many people read it in the group and the discussion we can have on it. But I read it, and I will say this. It's not a unique book. 
um, in the terms of plot. It's, we've all read this book before. It's a YA fantasy. However, I really appreciate that we're getting these books, but with more diverse cast. I don't like that we publish a lot of YA books where I feel like I'm reading the same thing over and over again, but there's no representation of racial diversity, orientation diversity, any disability rep. It's, it, they're books that have been read and written before time and time again, and they offer nothing new. However, this book, it offers these traditional tried and true YA fantasy structure that we know is successful, that we know that we enjoy reading, but a diverse cast. Um, I also am just apparently trash for books that have animals that like are like, I don't know what the proper word is, but they're like sort of human, but they're not. But like, they're, they're not like pets, but they're there. Like, you know what I mean? And this has that, which I loved. Uh, I'm also really recently just been enjoying, I feel like a lot of books set in more dry, like desert-like settings, um, which this offers me as well. And I can really appreciate, you know, someone who is not cis, straight, white, atheist from natural born in Canada, reading a book that is like, oh, I see myself as this Muslim girl in here, this Muslim girl of color, or these this gentleman in here. Like, I can really appreciate that. So I will absolutely say, if you're if going in, go in knowing you've probably read this book before, but the characters are what you're really going to love. I also, again, as a debut, was very pleasantly surprised by this. This is a bigger book, for sure. It was much bigger than I was expecting. Um, but the, the author didn't cheap out on character growth, on world development, none of that. It's very fleshed out. And I was honestly wonderfully surprised. Because if you're going to do that book that's been written a few times before, um, give me something unique. And if it's giving me this vividly detailed world that you see in your mind that you've never seen in books before, because let's be real, we always write why traditional fantasies in books in, in books set in worlds that could basically just be colonial England a couple centuries ago, right? So getting this was wonderful. It's, it, 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 it was, it was, I've read this before, but it was also refreshing in that same sense. Um, I'm definitely going to read the sequel. Um, and I, like I said, I'm very impressed with this author's writing. I want to continue following her and see what else she puts out. And I hope people read it. We're having a discussion at the end of the month in the TBR and Beyond group. Then I read Echo North by Joanne Ruth Meyer. This was, um, I didn't hate this book by any means. It's not a bad book. This author has beautiful writing to lend itself to fantasies, folklores, fairy tales. Take anything like Grimm Brothers, Hans Christian Andersen, fairy tale type vibes. She has writing that really, really, really well fits with that sort of, 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 of theme and darkness and just taking these, the, the, the fairy tales before Disney like messed with them and like made them all like, you know, like when you've re read the original Grimm Brothers, I haven't read the full original Grimm Brothers. I remember reading parts of it, but like the sisters cut off parts of their feet to fit them in the glass slipper. Like Disney, Disney excluded that part. Okay. <laughs> so I feel like taking those original um, fantasies and folklores that were used originally to like scare kids and give them like morals of the time, the author has writing that really, really fits well with that sort of stuff. So if she wants to keep going on that path, I am really, really excited um, to follow her and see what else she comes out with. This is just a Beauty and the Beast retelling where the Beast is a wolf, okay? I have had strong feelings on this channel about Beauty and the Beast retellings in the past. So I'll try to condense it as much as possible. Um, they've become unnecessary at this point. If you're going to do a Beauty and the Beast retelling, you've got to give me something different. You've got to, it's got to do something for me. For example, Sergei Mass combines it with a bunch of other fantasies and, and, and fairy tales and folklore retellings. So you can see parts of it, but then it kind of spins in its own different direction. And the characters are just very vividly iconic in that series. A Curse So Dark and Lonely, I was very hesitant to pick that one up. We have a main character who is has a physical disability, and then she has a brother who is a part of the queer community. So, and then it does change, and we don't have this sort of Stockholm Syndrome situation. And it's going to keep going in its own different direction based on how it's ended. Fantastic. Making it your own. This didn't do any of that. It's not bad, like I said, by any means. This is exactly what's been written before as a fairy, as a Beauty and the Beast retelling. It's been written before. It offers nothing new to this other than the Beast is a wolf. It's girl, get, you know, follows weird creature into the forest for the sake, for the name of her father. Her mother has been passed away and there's a cruel queen situation. Um, she has to stay in the, in the underground house thing with the Beast for a year, um, but she can't look at him. Kind of the same equivalent of she can't fall. She has to say she falls in love with him. Um, it's 
we've you've read it before i promise you um so know that going in pay attention to like said to the writing the characters are fine but like literally nothing of this was new uh, nothing of this stood out as being iconic or special this has been written before unfortunately in the end i think i gave it like a three out of five stars i was just so disappointed when i got like 20 chapters and i was like oh god really are we is this actually a beauty and the beast retelling for reals is this the path we're going down but that being said even though if the book if the writing had sucked at that point i would have just dnf'd it but i liked the writing so i'm definitely going to keep following this author and lastly i read the woman's war by jenna glass this week it's a bigger book for sure but oh my god it was good so it is hashtag me too hashtag resistance in a fantasy um epic series First of all, they did a cover change from the hardcover of book one to the paperback, and then they've done a cover reveal for book two. I like the cover change. I don't think I say that very often. Um, it, it fits with the actual book when I look at specific details, like on the, um, actually I never even noticed it was on the first first new cover. But on the second book cover, they have like this queen silhouette standing between two kingdoms. And that is like literally a metaphor, like a visual re representation of what this book is. This woman in this in-between between these two kingdoms. I just love that. So The Women's War had, um, it's not an easy read. Also, random side note, I saw somewhere <laughs> that someone was like, DNF at 30%, it's just misogyny. Friend, first of all, 30% in. This book is two hours on, or 20 hours on audiobook. So, I mean, maybe she read like six or seven hours into it at most, which, you know, things are messed up. It's it's a book about Me Too and resistance. Um, They're going to have to set up the misogyny in order to justify the sort of resistance. That's That happens. Um, it's never deemed as okay by any means in this book. Um, I will also put a bit of a trigger warning in here. It is never graphically detailed by any means. It just insinuates a lot of rape throughout this book um, by the evil guys, okay? It's never condoned. It's deemed very much wrong by the women, but it is status quo in this world. Women are used essentially as incubators. Their only purpose is to be married off, really no matter what social class of you are coming from, which I thought was really interesting to put in there. Um, and there's no specifications of anyone's race uh, that I remember in this book either, that women are used, they're married off to men, and if they don't give children, m sons really to be the you know the heir and passing everything on then they are very quickly um within a couple of years at max um divorced and sent to this abbey where they end up being the prostitutes and that's where the local knights go and guards and everything go to whore out basically um it was interesting that that was basically the only like place where they had prostitutes though it was like a government sanctioned run brothel um, and it did not matter what your social class was when you went to those places in this whole story it starts off with like one of the former queens who was divorced because she only had a um a daughter um that's where she ends up so all of this kicks off when a magical spell is ena enabled within the first few pages that threatens the balance of power of this patriarchy of everything is men run everything is male lineage women are just baby makers that's all we see their purpose for and it changes. Um, we get multiple POVs from women all in different um, upper level positions for the most part, and then someone from the Abbey. And it all starts that women start having the ability to not get pregnant if they don't want to. Which, as you can imagine, after being raped and abused and forced into a marriage by a man who treats you like garbage, not many women are very interested in birthing their children. So, things are concerning to begin with and then as a repercussion because the woman who cast the spell is from the abbey the king to be absolute douche canoe um garbage human being banishes the abbey to this like no man's land think of it as like where the hyenas live in the lion king that it's technically not that kingdom's land anymore but he sends them there no one really owns the land it's like a dead land it's considered to be uninhabitable they get there and there's a magical well. There's magical wells all over this kingdom, um, but the spells and everything are casted based on certain, certain like components and irons and like just think of it like the table of contents. And some of them are leaning towards feminine, feminine like c ingredients, and some are masculine. As you can imagine, this world is heavily geared towards the masculine. And then all of a sudden, new female components start showing up, and women start being able to craft new magical things. So balance shifting again. And in this no man's land, all of a sudden they're, start, they're able to start building this essentially village. 
And with no one claiming the territory, you can imagine this no man's land has the potential to turn into a threat. And if they've got all these magical powers and run by mostly women, boy, you screwed. Um, so that douchey, douche canoe of a, of a king, almost king guy, um, has to try and stamp down on that. He's a, a dictator in just oversized pants, basically. It takes all of these things that we're dealing with right now that men are finally being like, wait, like, you guys don't like this? Like, you guys don't like when we, like, do this to you? And women are like, no, we've never liked when you did that to us. It's taking all of these things and putting them in this fantasy context, and it's this slow political shift of power happening when all of a sudden there's only female heirs everywhere, and all of a sudden I'm only having your child if you treat me with respect, and all of a sudden this, why do we have a male-only lineage? Um, oh, actually, there's no law that specifies it's male only. We've just always insinuated this stuff. It was so well done. I also love that there are men on the side of helping in, in, women and this whole feminist thing. Um, so it doesn't create this men versus women um, conflict, which I was concerned it might. It doesn't. I was so relieved when that happened. The characters are all really coolly interwoven, but they all have their own distinct plots and their own voices. So we get multiple POVs. I think there's four POVs in total. Um, I loved this book. I am so excited for the paperback with that new cover to come out. I'm going to pick that up and it will definitely pick up the second book when it comes out in paperback with that pretty purple cover. Um, I would really recommend this book if you are interested at all in feminist literature or just as a fantasy in general. It's a really good fantasy. Um, it's a bigger book though, so don't get 30% in and be like, oh, this whole book is misogyny. No, it's setting up a world that needs a Me Too movement. Ta-da! But yeah, so in the end, I gave this a 5 out of 5 stars absolutely loved it. I Let me know if you read this, actually. I really want to hear what other people think of this. So those are all the books that I read this week. Let me know in the comment section down below what you read this week. I would love to know. Um, and if you've read any of these books, I would also love to know. I'm sorry, I feel like I was very rambly speed talking today. That's just how I've been. Um, so that is this video. I will link all of these books in the description down below, along with all of my social media. If you follow me, I will follow you back, and I will see you on Tuesday.